Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this session. We are really excited to be here to talk about inclusivity in global value chains, especially commodity value chains, and to also examine how impact investing can play a key role in advancing inclusivity in value chains. And to do this, we have a really qualified panel bringing in diverse perspectives. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. We have Isufu Isaka joining us from Western Ghana, and he represents the Sefwi Bekwai Farmers Union in Ghana. And he is also a smallholder cocoa farmer himself. We have Anne Park joining us from the Bay Area and represents SEIF, which is a global impact private equity manager that supports small and medium businesses to not just grow, but also contribute to climate resilience, inclusion, and food security. We have Yasmina Zedman joining us from Acumen. Acumen uses patient capital to scale market-based approaches towards social impact and inclusion. And my name is Madhyama. I represent Solidaridad. Solidaridad is a global nonprofit organization. We focus on building resilient and inclusive commodity value chains globally. And we do this by working with all the actors along the chain. So smallholder farmers, companies, governments, impact investors, and other stakeholders. We have a lot to cover today. So let's jump right in. Our first question is for Isufu. Isufu, we all are aware that the concept of inclusion is now gaining center stage thanks to COVID, thanks to several other global social movements. And I think a lot of us are also aware that the cocoa sector in West Africa offers one of the starkest examples of global inequities, where a smallholder farmer can earn really low wages, whereas the global chocolate industry makes giant profits. Now, from your perspective, both as a smallholder farmer yourself and also the leader of a cocoa cooperative, what do you feel are the elements that are missing? What does inclusivity look like for you? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Inclusive supply chain as a farmer or a cooperative chairman what we have identified is that Uku farmers are not allowed to partake decision in the international level. What we only do is production, and after production, it ends there. At least there should be a communication barrier that will link Uku farmers, who are the producers, to the regulator, to the government, and to the international bodies, that's processors and then chocolatiers. If you do that, and we are able to involve the farmers in decision making, it will help the farmers to understand and know what actually goes on in terms of cocoa trading. But as we speak, farmers don't know anything about cocoa trading in terms of cocoa uh, pricing in the international level, they don't know they, and they don't have access to. So I think the, the, the element that is not seen here is that at the cocoa sector, farmers we know that out of 100% gains, only 5 to 6% goes to production and the rest goes to the other traders, that is the LBCs and then the, 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 the chocolatiers and the processors. So if you're able to accumulate about $100 billion uh, gains in a year from cocoa, at least there should be a fair sharing or fair gains among the supply chain. In this case, you have to have a mandatory body that will consist of the farmers, the regulator, the government, the the, the processors and the chocolatiers to make sure there is a mandatory law that will bite all these supply uh, uh, supply chain game players to know what is really happening so that farmers will get to understand the business of cocoa 
in the world. Thanks, Isufu. Let me turn to Anne. Anne, Seif has several years of experience in investing in small and medium enterprises, which in fact all, also ultimately have an impact on smallholder producers. Based on your experience over the years, what are some of the key lessons that you have learned in making high impact investments? And specifically, what do businesses, co-ops like Sefwi Bekwai need to do to be more attractive to investors like you? Well, with over 30 years of experience supporting SMEs in emerging markets, we've learned a lot about what is needed to help companies grow and scale. We've adapted our due diligence process over the years to ensure more consideration is given to downstream impacts on smallholders and to ensure that we're really thinking through all the issues of inclusion. That being said, we're still an investor at the end of the day with a fiduciary responsibility to our LPs and all the regular aspects of due diligence still apply. We review our le the leadership teams and their governance structures. We look at audited financials of the organization and we analyze market opportunities and sector specific risks. So what companies can do to help us assess risk is to provide as much data as possible around revenue, such as proof of contracts, uh, yield data, uh, other measures to address risk or the perception of risk, such as uh, insurance. So we also look at how inv our investments can be catalytic to the growth of the company and how we can add value to help that company have more impact as it goes uh, through the impact we look at either on the customer side or via the value chain side. And I think really the best way to understand the types of companies we invested in, in the agri space is really through examples. So um, I'd like to point to one investment we've made in Morocco uh, in a company called Soit, which is a technology company which provides farmers information about how to better run their operations and to optimize uh, their use of inputs. They use uh, drones, satellite images, and other proprietary images, uh, and they're proprietary image processing algorithm to gather data which can serve farmers and help them op optimize irrigation and fertilizer. So for um, all agribusinesses, we really think through where in the agribusiness uh, value chain we can really have the most impact and uh, we focus on companies that really do serve smallholder farmers. Right, and and just to, just to expand on that a little more, um, what are the kind of services you feel, based on your experience, that these businesses need to be able to engage with investors like you? Really, oftentimes it's just getting their financial books in order. It's really building the case for how they can grow their revenue and how they, we, as an investor, should be assessing risk differently. So as I mentioned, if you're giving us data for um, how to curb that perception of risk or Oftentimes, smallholders, there are a lot of exogenous risks, right, associated with weather and things of this nature. I mean, what they are doing to address those risks really help us understand how it will affect the investment in the longer term. Great. So more data, more transparency, I guess, makes it relatively easier for groups like CFB Bekwai to engage with investors like you. Let me move to Yasmina. Yasmina. Uh, Acumen's inclusive business playbook has this marvelous quote, which says, market forces are not invisible hands, they are our hands. I thought that was an extremely powerful quote. Also, the playbook then goes on to illustrate practical ways by which both companies and impact investors can embed inclusivity in their business models. Now, as Solidaridad, very often we run into a situation where when we are engaging companies, we, you, we see that you can either have uh, people in the company who are socially minded and are keen to make investments to further inclusivity in the value chain, such as by supporting smallholder producers. While on the other hand, you can have people, let's say, in the procurement teams who are probably just more pragmatic and cost conscious. Based on your experience, what are the ways by which we can bridge this divide between social impact and profitability? And what needs to be done to get greater buy-in regarding the benefits of patient capital? That's a, it's a great and it's a big question. Um, 
in some ways, I think that we're seeing more and more the business case for sustainability and inclusion. And you see that in trends in terms of the number of funds that are looking at ESG, the, the ways that investors are expanding the pool of capital for the kinds of investments that could ultimately help us build a more sustainable and inclusive world. So that's a very positive sign. But I don't think we can really get away from the fact that we still are living within a capitalist system that seems to be better at exploiting people and planet than building sustainability and inclusion. And so we're looking at examples of disruption of that that are coming from the private sector, the public sector, and certainly from entrepreneurs. Um, so we talk a lot about leadership and investing in character. And likewise, who we partner with and sources of capital, policymakers need to have that same commitment to thinking longer term about what it means to build a more inclusive and sustainable planet and environment um, that allows everyone to thrive. If you have that in place, you still are, you know, we're working with market-based approaches. And to Anne's point, we are looking for models that can scale, that can become self-sustaining, um, and can interact with public and private markets in really smart ways. So for Acumen, since we operate across the spectrum of capital, working with early stage ventures that might need seed funding or go through one of our accelerators, or using philanthropy to help catalyze new business models that we think can help solve problems like off-grid energy access or innovations in the agriculture sector, and then ultimately launching commercial funds. Today, we're managing about $160 million in commercial funds funds we've launched just in the past four years to really recognize that capital gap continues to exist even after that kind of early pioneer gap um, is, is sort of faced. So we think it's about looking at the full spectrum of capital and the full ecosystem of business models that are needed to tackle these deeper systemic problems. Um, so I think that's kind of where the buy-in comes from is people recognizing based on what they view as success, you know, where they really want to make a difference, whether it's on climate change, uh, empowerment of women, inclusion of smallholder farmers, and then where on that spectrum of capital they can make the biggest difference based on sources of capital. Um, and in our view, there isn't one type. It's you need that full ecosystem. And so a lot of our work at Acumen has been in that investment readiness. So it's really helpful to hear and talk about these are the things we look for because those are the strengths we're trying to build particularly in that sort of pioneer stage company, helping them build the internal financial systems, helping them think through their longer term growth strategy um, and building those strong internal systems of governance that when they go to the next stage of investor, they're fully prepared for that next round of capital. And so for us with our philanthropy backed investing, one of the big measures of success is, are they tapping into new sources of capital? Are we crowding in capital from not only impact investors, but even commercial investors that are starting to look at ESG? Um, so yeah, I, I think it's very much this idea that it will take all of us. Um, and, and if we are able to collaborate in that way, we can move towards shared goals where everyone might have the same vision, but they may have different kinds of capital or different assets to bring to the, the solution. Great, great, thanks for that comprehensive list, Yasmina. Uh, a question for you, uh, who do you think are some of the other actors in the ecosystem who can play a pivotal role in supporting access to finance for smallholder producers? Yeah, I feel like this is such a, a great question because one of the things that we've been reflecting on is that there's a huge opportunity for large corporations to play a much more proactive role. In some ways, the investing landscape is further along in recognizing the potential to combine both returns and impact. And we've seen in some ways through this community at SOCAP, the real burgeoning and growth of this community with that diversity. What we're seeing less of and need to see more of is on the market side, having corporations and to some degree the public sector as well play their role in helping to really create that market access. Um, so we just launched a report um, with support from Solidaridad and partnership with IKEA and others to really tell the story of where entrepreneurs are successfully building business partnerships with corporations that can help them scale their impact. A lot of these enterprises already have access to capital, but what they need is that market to achieve the real growth potential. And so that to us is kind of the missing piece of the equation and it is starting to happen, but we really wanna see that accelerate because the best kind of money for a fast growing enterprise is revenue. 
um, investment is a really important catalyst, but their ultimate goal is to grow revenue. And so we're excited to see how corporations in the public sector could play a much bigger role when it comes to procurement and really proactively looking for ways to source from businesses that have social impact at their core. I also okay. feel like there's a responsibility for impact investors to really think about the financial products they're offering to the market. Yasmina, you were referencing um, the gamut of financial products Acumen provides and also really thinking through where the gaps are because the last thing we wanna do is displace uh, you know, market activity and really create a distortion in the market. And I think this is something that Acumen does really well. That analysis is really critical. Also, the corporations allow for investors like us. So for example, Isufu, if he has a contract with a large corporate, that signals to us that there is less risk in investing in a co-op uh, such as his. But then how does he access capital to fulfill that uh, contract? So Seif has really been very thoughtful about creating financial products that really meet the needs and really fills a gap in the market. Um, that working capital loan is really critical in order to fill that contract so that that corporation still continues to work with, with smaller actors along the value chain. And I think impact investors really need to think about those interventions and when to deploy them. Couldn't agree more. Great, thanks. Those are fantastic points, both of you have brought up. Let me turn back to Isufu. Isufu, both Yasmina and Anne have shared some really good points about how enterprises like Sefwi Bekwai can be more investment ready. Do you agree with what they have shared? Do you think they are still missing something? It's good to consider other factors that influence an investor to do an investment in an area. But if you come to our area where cocoa farmers are grouped, uh, they don't necessarily put in a financial reporting. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so what I, I, I can say is that for cocoa sourcing in our area, farmers have been well educated to go about because there are other cooperatives who do cocoa sourcing in some area whereby we have gone to them and built experience to make sure that any time uh, investors come to our aid to make sure we do uh, trade trade with them, we, we, we can be able to organize ourselves. So in our area, farmers don't put that uh, records into being or into implementation. But as, as time goes on, if you're able to get an investor who will be likely to invest in the cocoa sourcing, you make sure all the right information about revenue and other things that will compare the investor to come in will be done. Great, thanks for that. Isufu, can you also make a business case as to why businesses like Sefwi Bekwai can be of value to investors or how such businesses can be a great investment in order to strengthen inclusivity in value chains? So Shibakwai is a good area to do investment because cocoa farmers in this area have been able to come together to team up to form an association or cooperative which is very reliable, very strong mm. and very, very, very understandable. This association has been there for about four good years. So uh, currently the association have trained farmers to alternative livelihood projects where some farmers are into poultry farming and others too are into cash crop farming. So what we want to do is that we want to do a cocoa sourcing as an association, as a group. We have to source our own cocoa from members and not allowing other people to come and take the cocoa from the farmers, but the farmers themselves buying the cocoa themselves to gain extra income apart from the production of the cocoa. Great, thank you so much. That was an incredible conversation. Let us now turn it over to the audience for questions. That was wonderful. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to bring in Isufu's um, perspective. 
just for all the audience who are tuning in, it was a little bit of a challenge. We were very keen to bring in um, a, a smallholder farmer's perspective directly from the field. But given that there were very severe uh, power uh, outages and internet issues, it was a bit of a challenge. But yeah, we are very glad that we were able to bring in his voice via video. Um, before we turn it to the audience, one of the questions we had uh, in mind was having Anne uh, and Yasmina, when she comes online, to respond to Isufu's pitch as such, when he makes a business case for a group like Sefi Bekwai to get investments from impact investors. And uh, what did you think of the pitch? And linking back to your experience again, um, what, what do you feel is missing? He did say that mm -hmm. at this um, uh, maintaining financial records with a great level of detail, and which is what you had mentioned that is very critical for investors. And I think groups like Solidaridad are, in fact, trying to play that role of bridging the gap. But uh, yeah, uh, it would be lovely to hear from you as to uh, what, what you think about that pitch that um, Isufu just made. Yes, you know, I agree with Isufu in that um, processors are oftentimes the ones that benefit the least when um, commodities go to market and when there are processing uh, components of it where value addition happens upstream. Uh, what we would like to hear more about essentially is the governance structure of his co-op, who on his team would be in charge of ensuring that there are they have a diversified pipeline in terms of their sales. Um, who are his current off takers? Is it just one large corporation? Does he have more than one contract? All of these things would uh, give us a better understanding of his business so that um, as he's raising capital and he, as, as he's pitching the opportunity, um, I think many other investors would want to know, okay, what does your team look like? Where, well, how would you spend that capital? Um, and are you able to scale um, to the degree that you would want to scale given, uh, given your goals? Great. Thanks, Anne. With that, I guess we can now turn it over to questions from the audience. So I'm just going to go through the list that we have here. And uh, our first question, which uh, came through, was from Joanne. And she asks, and that question is directed to you, Anne, as to how does the information really funnel down to a small cocoa farmer who cannot you know, take a debt or equity um, on his or her own terms as against a larger co-op. Uh, what is your uh, take on this uh, more, a, a larger issue? So we primarily invest in those processors. Those are, that's the level of SME and that's typically where we play uh, along the agribusiness value chain. So we rely very heavily on those uh, smallholder businesses, the, those SMEs to relay that information to their smallholders because the smallholders are a part of their business model. Uh, we also rely very much on technical assistance providers on the ground to provide that information and to help with those investment readiness programs. We at SEEP also have an investment readiness program called the SEED program because we have also learned that entrepreneurs need more than capital to really scale their businesses. And oftentimes they don't need capital to scale, the, scale their businesses. When you take on outside capital, really there are a lot of strings attached that um, folks don't often think about when they, um, when they look to fundraise. Uh, so a lot of that information really even can come from investment officers like ourselves, but primarily through the SMEs uh, that we work with, that we invest in. Great. Hi, Yasmina. Hi. Hi, Yasmina. Welcome to the live Q&A. Uh, perfect timing. I was just asking Anne if she had um, a response to Isufu's pitch. I'm not sure if you were able to uh, listen in on the recording that just played. Yes. OK, yes. great. So uh, would you like to share your uh, response to Isufu's pitch? Yeah, I mean, I was also trying to figure out how to get into this link. Um, but my, my general sense of part of what he was talking about was just increasing not only transparency, but the potential for direct access. Um, and that's something that I think is a really important growing trend to do direct trade. Um, I think that there's 
a lot of issues in doing that in Coco because in some cases it's not even legal or allowed, but they're starting to make inroads and in allowing cooperatives to do direct trade and supporting cooperatives um, like Isufu's. So I think there's a, a major regulatory issue, um, but my hope would be that investors and corporations will do what they can to build the capacity of organizations like his to directly trade in as much as the regulations permit that. Great. And uh, would both of you, Anne and then uh, Yasmina, would you also be able to speak to your experiences in the for-profit space and to also probably draw some lessons from other sectors? Uh, we specifically have a question about uh, social impact healthcare startups, and I definitely know both of you have experience in working with different sectors. So what are some of the lessons that you can draw from these other uh, areas as well? So the beginning of your question really focused on the social impact. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs need to understand um, the values of the impact investor and what impact they're trying to achieve and match the, not all impact investors are the same, right? Some are trying to meet certain targets around um, carbon reduction. And if your company really can articulate those metrics, I think that that is the right investor for you. For us, we are sector agnostic. So we really invest in SMEs because our theory of change is about the effect those SMEs have on their local communities, primarily through employment and primarily through the trickle down effect of the increase in the rev revenue through our investments. So our social impact metrics really focus on climate resilience, on uh, inclusion, and as we define inclusion, that includes all of the uh, issues around uh, gender inclusion and really serving marginalized people. So um, lessons learned, they vary quite a bit depending on sector, but for us, it's really trying to fill a gap in the market where entrepreneurs that want to scale aren't able to scale because capital is the primary constraint. And every investment we make, the metrics are custom to that company because every sector, it, it varies quite a bit. In every region, the targets vary quite a bit, but we really think through what are the downstream effects such that we can really focus on uh, climate resilience and um, issues around access to um, just fair wages and um, increasing the number of employees really is one of our key metrics in, in getting it towards that. Yeah, and, and just adding to that, I think for Acumen, we've found that in, because our lens has been less on employment and more on the sort of impact of the products and services of the company, which I think is a very, you know, complementary approach. I think both are are tremendous in, in creating more value at the community level. Um, so we've looked at sectors like off-grid energy access or agriculture, specifically where we see there's a huge opportunity to introduce business models that can really help move people out of poverty. Um, and some of those models are huge employers as well, and others are, are more targeted. For example, in the tech space, they're creating economic opportunity, but they themselves may not be big employers. So the metric we tend to focus on is, are we actually reaching low-income people? And how are we helping move them out of poverty around some specific issues? There was a question, I think, also around how we choose a sector. And we think that there are issues that are, you know, think real barriers for people coming out of poverty, such as access to energy, um, access to a dignified work and access to agricultural kind of services and platforms that enable farmers to increase their incomes. Uh, what's been helpful for us is having that kind of sector focus within a regional context that's really driven at the local level to understand how do you find the right business models to address that issue at scale in a market like East Africa versus a market like West Africa, where you might see very different barriers and needs or India or Latin America. And so having local teams has helped us to get that perspective on which sectors to focus on and which metrics are gonna be the most meaningful in that context. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Great, thank you. Um, and just going back to you, um, you do have some experience in terms of facilitating access to finance for co-ops in particular, which we had discussed a few days back was a, a slightly different entity from a more established um, uh, small and small or medium enterprise. Uh, are there any lessons you could draw based on your uh, lessons with co-ops in particular? 
The main translation we need to do really is around the governance structure. When you're working with a private entity, it's really clear what the ownership structure tends to be, and that tends to be a little bit less clear with co-ops. So a lot of what we're having to do is translate some of the roles into kind of what we would see traditionally as who, who is the general manager, um, who executes on sales, who you know really focuses on uh, driving revenue, and then really trying to understand who, where the levers are in terms of decision making so that as we have discussions around how can we increase inclusion or how can we make sure that even those within the cooperative are all being heard equally, that we have a clear understanding of how what the parity is with some of our due diligence processes for, for private sector, um, for just, just tr traditional private companies. Uh, so I think that's why there is a little bit more difficulty into investing in the co-ops because you do need to do a little bit more of that translation. And again, because the governance structure isn't consistent across all co-ops, it's difficult for us to necessarily make blanket statements about, well, this is the type of co-op that we look at versus this is the type of co-op that we don't work uh, look at. And it also varies by, by crop. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question about the role of companies in supply chains. And so Yasmina, I'll first turn that over to you and, and feel free to chime in. Uh, the question is, how can we evaluate big companies making supply chains more, more inclusive or the extent that they help to facilitate inclusivity? Uh, what's the data and validation that we need? And I think uh, based on... Um, Acumen's even recent experience with uh, corporations, I think you would be very well placed to answer that. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's an interesting question because I think it gets us to the, the fact that inclusive can mean different things. Um, and again, I think that um, Anne makes a really good point about being clear about the metrics for success um, because I found that inclusive can really mean anything from working with um, diverse communities, working with low income communities, working with people with disabilities, people who've had traditionally uh, faced barriers to access to jobs and the market. So I think it's important to really narrow in on that definition. And where I think companies are doing a good job is recognizing where in their value chain they can be more inclusive, um, where they see actual vulnerabilities that are being exacerbated by a business model. For example, having children in the labor force or the incredibly low wages of farmers working with certain crops. And to really take those head on rather than kind of going through the, for the low hanging fruit, uh, where can you easily make things more inclusive from an optics perspective, but leave behind folks that are in fact made most vulnerable by that value chain. Um, and companies are finding really important ways to address that, whether it's from the original producers of raw materials for a value chain or all the way on the other end in terms of distribution, who's distributing products and how much are they earning from that. Um, so we did an inclusive business playbook designed for businesses that want to embed inclusivity into their model in partnership with EY. And it seems to us that there's places throughout the entire business model where that inclusion factor can come in. And again, you have to really pinpoint what you're trying to address and then hold yourself accountable for that. So you don't look just within the walls of your company, but you look really beyond that at suppliers, at distributors, at producers that create the materials that you might not even be buying. They might be going to suppliers um, and then helping to set those targets. But what we've also found is that inclusion as a concept really only seems to take off when you have it embedded in the purpose of the company, right? And we've talked a lot about that today at SOCAP, that it isn't just about having a metric or one that people are paying attention to, but really defining your core business as one that is creating benefit for all um, and then looking for ways to drive that benefit through your business rather than mitigating the harm that you might be causing. Um, so I think it starts really at the top in terms of values, and then it can really move through every facet of the business with that real accountability for who is being impacted and how they are included in the economy and frankly, in decision making in ways that that haven't been the case. Great. And would you also be able to offer some examples? Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. The one that's been on my mind is Azahar Coffee. It's a coffee company that we work with. It's based in Colombia. They work across Latin America. And they are really a fan of radical transparency about the wages that coffee farmers receive. And they build their pricing model around living wages for farmers. Um, so they've created a sustainable coffee buyer's guide that they think is really about changing the coffee um, the coffee market and putting farmers at the center. They work with Stumptown Coffee and Blue Bottle Coffee, a number of companies that 
find that there are customers who are really excited to consume a product that is not only of really high quality, but has inclusion embedded within it. Um, and so if you look at their business model, the farmer knows exactly not only how much they're paying, but how much the company will be making from the coffee that they sell. Um, and that's really empowering farmers with information that makes them a part of the process rather than keeping them sort of, I think to Isufu's point, really in a place within the value chain where they have very little access to information and very little agency. They're price takers um, in almost every case. Here, farmers are actually engaged in the process and can negotiate because they have visibility into the margins at every step of the process. That, that's, that's a really that's powerful- That's Azahar coffee. <laughs> uh, and do you have any examples of innovative ways of working which can uh, support not just the businesses by but by extension also the smallholder producers? Well, to Yasmina's point about really starting with the values of the company, when we make our investments, we talk with our um, entrepreneurs and we talk with the management teams about what their goals are from a business perspective. And we really try to build the case around how collecting some of these social impact metrics really are not about doing a separate exercise, but really thinking through how having focusing on some of these areas and they naturally do it in the stories that they tell about the businesses, but really um, helps them from a, a material standpoint in terms of growing their business, either through uh, marketing and the halo effect that they get when they do focus on um, genuinely tracking the number of women that they serve. They could say, hey, my industry, there are a lot of women that work in grocery stores, but really we create benefits for these women because we've created a daycare on site. And we say, okay, let's actually start tracking this. And let's say, is this really material to your business? And how has this helped you in terms of employee retention? So that it is a sustainable solution. It's not something they do for a period of time just to you know, tell their impact investor that they did it, but really so that they see the benefit in the long term um, from a business perspective. So when you, um, Majama, ask about business models and, and what, um, how to have lasting change, really for us, it's about building that case with the entrepreneur. Inclusion for us means really inclusion, serving those that are marginalized and really serving those that um, are currently not being thought of uh, in, in a systemic way. So an uh, example of a company that we've invested in recently is one called Ecoflora, which produces a natural food dye using the Hagua plant. And we are working with smallholder farmers in a rural part of Colombia. They currently do not grow the Hagua plant 100%. Some of them are doing just doing it uh, subsistently. But because they are now working with Ecoflora and we're looking to scale the business, we can, in a more systematic way, have uh, more guaranteed income for those smallholder farmers, increase the number of smallholder farmers that are growing the hagua plant and moving cattle farmers away from cattle ranching so that it reduces the degradation in this area. Um, so inclusion to us in this example is inclusion along the supply chain. Um, but it's also serving uh, the greater good of creating a blue dye, which is natural and not carcinogenic, because all, all chemical forms of blue dye currently are carcinogenic. Great. Uh, we'll we'll drill in a little more into uh, aspects of uh, innovation and challenges. I just want to bring up the next question. Uh, this is about new regional currencies that create more credit for farmers to use within the ecosystem, but outside of the local national currency. Um, are these um, innovations that you have tried? in your business models? Ha have you uh, experience with them? And uh, what's wh what's your feedback on such um, uh, payment for impact models? Well, it's something that we're looking at, not um, at this stage in the context of um, agriculture credit, but credit for energy access where we've seen that um, energy access products, especially those that are not just small, low, in low cost products for lighting, but slightly larger systems that can actually power a household or energy um, products that are used for uh, productive use. 
And this also gets into the question of sustainable value chains and supply chains, because it's essentially a way to help localize value addition, um, things like milk chillers or small scale mills, um, enabling people to participate in value addition for agriculture using solar power, even if they don't have access to the grid. Um, and doing it in a way that's better for the environment and climate change. So what we found is that being able to distribute those products really does require access to finance. Um, you're helping people to create assets, but they also need to find a way to finance that. And um, and the reality is that it's just much harder to get access to finance the, the less a part of the formal economy you are. So we would love to find ways to incentivize people to extend credit uh, to either through distributors or directly to customers in markets that have not been well served um, through energy, off-grid energy access. And we see across the continent of Africa, some countries where there's relatively widespread access to off-grid energy and others where you still see rates of electrification of 30% or 40%, leaving most people out. Um, so that's, I think, a real opportunity for investors to think about how to create incentives for entrepreneurs and for businesses to extend credit and maybe mitigating some of the risk they might face by extending credit to low income customers. So where are you creating access for the first time, reaching customers that have been overlooked and recognizing that that might create a higher cost or higher risk and not forcing the company to bear that burden? Because if they are, they will stay out of those markets. It just simply may not make sense. So I think there's a lot of room for financial innovation in trying to reach difficult to serve markets um, and something that we're really excited to start exploring, particularly in the energy access space. Great. And would you have uh, anything to add to that? Um, only that see if everything we do is hyper-local and our local teams really manage the investments because they understand the ecosystem best. Um, it, we have an investment into a company called Fax where they on lend to smaller businesses because we realize that, you know, our risk assessment tool only brings us to a certain level, but there are those with needs that um, are much smaller than what we can provide from an economic perspective. So Fax, we use uh, working capital factoring so that really we reduce the collateral needs for a lot of our smallholders and people can say, hey, I have this contract they can, and they can use that contract with a larger corporate as uh, something that we can assess their risk and then provide a loan against that uh, that contract. So I think there are a lot of innovative ways to be inclusive, but again, it's just about matching the right financial product to, to the need. Right. Um, and to answer uh, Jay, who uh, brought up this question, uh, this is something that we are, in fact, experimenting in Solidaridad uh, as part of our programming in Southern Africa, where farmers, in fact, through a suite of digital tools, and these have been developed by Solidaridad. So whenever farmers uh, you know, sign up and show up for trainings or they adopt good practices, they input the data in the digital tool on the basis of which they get tokens. And these tokens can be used in a local system, let's say, uh, you know, in a local input shop. And the, the farmer will possibly get a discount on the inputs that he or she needs to use, which will again be used for, let's say, improving soil health and by also providing data back into the system in terms of you know, improving soil health and uh, providing data on how much carbon was sequestered, the, the farmer can earn more tokens. So this is something we are uh, building as a way of uh, providing both incentives to farmers to adopt better practices, but also have it as a way of funneling finance and credit to um, smallholder producers. And this, this was a small, uh, relatively small, I would say, initiative that we had started a few years ago, uh, on the basis of which we are now, in fact, developing a much larger payment for impact ecosystem. And hopefully, we should be able to you know, talk more about it uh, maybe in the next OCAP. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we should have uh, information on our website about uh, this in this initiative is called Zawardi um, and that, that should be available already as well. Uh, let me go on to the next question which is about how can we get stakeholders to better collaborate? 
Um, I, I think each of you have touched upon different stakeholders and you've spoken about, you know, uh, um, uh, local uh, teams on the ground. Um, you've spoken about um, uh, groups that provide quality technical assistance, but which also, you know, speak to the market needs. Um, who are these stakeholders? How can we strengthen collaboration? And are, are things moving in the right direction or what are some of the big gaps that you still see, you know, holding on, which need to be addressed? I can take a crack at that. Um, you know, I think one of the founding ideas of the impact investing movement from the beginning was that if you create the right financial incentives, that the right stakeholders will come together. And I think you've seen that to a large degree. I think a lot of capital has been mobilized. Um, and I think there is a lot more collaboration now. We see it certainly in the development sector between development organizations, development finance institutions and investors. Um, but I also just think it's worth acknowledging that financial incentives in some ways only take you so far and there are still gaps. And so for us, I think bringing stakeholders together more and more can be around these bolder visions that have, um, again, are sort of values based. So looking at issues like climate change or gender equity and saying, you know, we're coming together, not because all the incentives are aligned, but because we have this bigger vision. And then you bring the best minds to the table. So again, innovations in finance that allow people to bring the capital they can bring is really smart. But I think what brings them to the table isn't just an opportunity to invest or make returns. Um, so I find that those coalitions that come together to advance a really ambitious vision, uh, which is what, what's needed now in the face of the challenges that we see, whether it's around global health, around inclusion, um, climate change, is really, really important. Um, and it's been exciting to see that in the business community, these coalitions emerging around net zero commitments or around racial equity. Um, and then again, bringing the tools to the table, but using capital as a means and not an end, I think will ultimately drive us faster towards those goals um, and recognizing that for some, they are still dealing with a set of constraints related to the kind of capital that they can bring um, and having a lot of transparency around that. Great. Anne? And I would say the coalitions are an effective tool because they tend to be an honest broker in the conversation. Um, impact investors, they are still trying to prove that you can get a certain return for the risk. So it may not be market return. It depends on the goal of the impact investor, but you can't start. Um, the, an impact investor is one of many players in that ecosystem that really uh, can contribute to the conversation. But um, I agree with Yasmina in that when you have the honest broker facilitating the conversation, really looking at the big picture issues, um, it allows for people to contribute in a way that makes sense rather than relying on the capital markets to just work the issues out onto themselves. Yeah, and I, again, I think that is one aspect that um, Solidaridad is um, really well connected with. I think across the board in all the countries, across all the different commodity supply chains that we work in, I think the core innovative piece that really drives long term change is the different multi stakeholder platforms that we uh, coordinate and facilitate. And as you were speaking, I think what what could take those to the next level is bringing elements of innovation within those uh, platforms. And again, we, we are seeing that as well, just in um, as part of one of our projects that we are developing for addressing deforestation in the Amazon. I think a, a, a few of the tools to monitor deforestation of indirect suppliers really came out of, and this was not directly our work. This was also our, this was mainly our partner's work, but which is going to be included potentially in a much larger initiative, the, the digital innovations that were developed came out of the challenges that were brought up by all the stakeholders in that multi-stakeholder platform. So yes, it's really important for sector stakeholders to really get together and work through these challenges together. And within that, yes, you can see what are the different solutions that really are uh, needed to make that shift. Is it a policy solution? Is it a digital tool? Is it uh, sector-wide research? And um, I think, yes, there's a lot of uh, possibility when you have groups coming together. Speaking of coalitions, uh, a very interesting question we have is that 
ESG metrics are not, in fact, standardized. Uh, this is given the fact that many of these um, metrics, uh, many of these frameworks do come out of some of these coalitions. Nevertheless, it seems like there are no standard metrics in the ESG industry. And then uh, there are the measurement costs as well. So how do you, um, Anne and uh, Yasmina, um, uh, see us addressing this issue in the near future? I think that's a great question, Nick, and you make a really good point about the cost of measurement because it is real and it is significant and nobody wants to bear the burden of that cost. So we have been trying to educate our LPs about the importance of having a separate facility to cover the cost of this due diligence and to really cover the cost of the technical assistance required to help our small businesses really adopt strong ESG forward strategies. So ESG for us in our due diligence process is really just getting to that do no harm bit, but we are leveraging an ESG forward strategy in that our entire CEF impact framework is um, designed to help find metrics that the company is already leveraging for their own business purposes in order to really think through the impact. So for example, uh, one of our investees, Sowit, they are a technology company. They uh, use um, drones to really collect information about the land so that the smallholders can have that real-time information as they're leveraging um, inputs to, to maximize yield. So how can we work with Sowit to make sure that the data that they're collecting for the growth of their company really is also um, helping tell their impact story and how can we optimize for that in our ESG due diligence. And we hire auditors to, to do our financial um, due diligence, but you know, finding folks that can do that on the impact side, it's not only challenging, but it requires us investing in our investment officers who are oftentimes investment bankers turned um, fund managers to train them about the importance of looking at ESG um, as not only a framework for do no harm, but as uh, a means for them to develop an impact strategy. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I think I'm validating the fact that you're touching on all the difficult topics for running, um, you know, in an ESG process. And really the, I think the LPs, if they are able to, and even uh, the challenges that we have with DFIs, are that they said, yes, we love that you have a hands-on technical assistance program to help support the entrepreneurs, but we don't wanna give you that grant capital alongside the, they want all of their money capitalized. But they're like, talk to this other person at this other side of our you know, organization that provide grants and oftentimes lining that up is very challenging. So yeah. it is a challenge, but it's necessary. Yeah, I agree. And I think what's interesting with ESG is I think that E and the G part are, are much better understood in terms of having metrics that can be validated and looking at some of the best practices around governance and tracking things like carbon emissions or water use. The S is the real mystery. Um, what does it mean to have something that is really having a social impact or mitigating harmful effects um, from a social perspective? Uh, so since for Acumen, we're really about the S and we're about poverty, we've been thinking a lot about this issue of measurement um, and it's hard to standardize, right? Because I think to Anne's point, a lot of different business models are going to have different kinds of impact. So when we talk about impacting low-income customers, it's a pretty rough uh, instrument to say how many people were impacted in some way. And we're trying to go deeper. So we've developed uh, and now have launched as a separate social um, enterprise called 60 Decibels, a methodology called Lean Data. And the whole point of it is to engage directly with the end users or beneficiaries or customers of a model that is meant to have social impact um, and to get direct feedback from those customers. And again, not only to validate whether or not they're reaching the target uh, customer, reaching them with the right kinds of impact, whether it's helping them move out of poverty, reduce health expenses, feel greater security, you know, what those metrics are can vary. Um, but also that we're, we're really making sure that this data is material for the entrepreneur, right? Not only for the investor uh, or source of capital to feel good that there's some impact there, but giving the entrepreneur real-time data about the performance of their business, um, whether their customers have high NPS scores, uh, if they have feedback on the product or service. And so we're finding it's really changing the dynamic from this kind of compliance lens to more of the power 
of data and ways that you can align impact with your core business objectives, which again, I think speaks to Anne's point that these things have to be material and not something that you're doing simply to be able to tap into capital. Um, so I think for us, it's it's not as hard as people think. <laughs> um, I think it can feel fuzzy, but the reality is that if your goal is, for example, to improve economic empowerment of women, there are all kinds of resources to do that and to communicate that. And investors are starting to make decisions based on that. But I think it's as people prioritize, whether serving vulnerable populations, empowering people that have been excluded, um, that the market is ready to respond. Um, when we just did this research on corporate ready social enterprises, they're delivering tremendous social impact value. Most of their corporate customers never even ask. Right. They focus exclusively on the end product, the price, if it's competitive in the marketplace. And I think those corporate customers are leaving value on the table because the impact is there. And if they can ask the right questions, they can say, not only are we delivering really high quality milk or coffee or inputs, um, but we are also doing it in a way that helps us achieve some of these SDG goals or uh, helps us meet our targets for ESG. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne and Yasmina. I think it was a brilliant conversation. Uh, leaves us with a lot of hope. And I think it also leaves us with a lot of work to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Hope you enjoyed the panel. <laughs>